October 27th, and I'm Marge Forster here with Barbara Bianca, and we're interviewing Hannah Smith Brubaker. Hi, Hannah. Thanks for Hi, Marge. Thank you. Well, um, we're so glad that you are participating in the LGBT History Project of Central PA, and <clears throat> I want to be sure that you understand that you can give your permission or put any restriction on how you want this material used, so we can think about it when it's all done. Okay. All right. So, tell me, where did life start out for you? Tell us about okay. your life and your family. <laughs> Uh, I was born in Tioga County, so in the northern tier of Pennsylvania, um, but spent most of my growing up years in McKean County. Um, my father was a Methodist minister, um, and so we did a lot of moving around from church to church and community to community. I think by the time I was 13, we had moved 11 times. So. A lot, a lot of changes um, over those years. Um, and uh, my parents divorced when I was about 10. My father then felt that um, that disqualified him from being a minister, which is unfortunate because I think it was a true calling for him. So he then went on to work in the steel mills and my mother uh, worked primarily as a financial officer for different businesses. So, but I loved growing up in a small town. Um, it was the sort of place where, yeah, everybody knew what everybody was doing, but nobody locked their doors. And um, I had a tremendous amount of access to the natural world. I spent hours and hours and hours with my siblings in forests and in streams and, uh, in caves, or a good good number of caves in the town where I grew up, and we would just leave first thing on a Saturday morning and not come back till the glass factory bliss <laughs> whistle blew at dinner time. So, what it was, was the name of the town? Port Allegheny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, how many siblings did you have? I have three siblings. I have two brothers and a sister. They're all younger than I am. Yes. <laughs> Did, was that any pressure for you? Um, sure, sure. I think particularly um, once my parents separated, that meant taking on a new role. Um, so I'm very, fought like cats and dogs as kids. We're all very close in age, but um, my mother passed away when um, she was in her 40s, so very young, but that was an extremely bonding experience for all of us, so we're pretty close as adults now. And yeah. your father stayed nearby? Yeah, he's in the, he was in the Pittsburgh area, so. So when your mother died, was he back in the picture more? Um, to some degree, but at that point, I was sort of off living my own life, so I, uh, after being in college for a couple of years, left for Europe for about four years, so. So, what, you talked about how it was for you to explore the natural world, and your father was a Methodist minister. Tell me about your participation in the church. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. Did that continue after he left mm -hmm. To some, to some degree, and I look back on those times, that sense of community was very important to me. Um, even as I grew and developed and changed my personal beliefs about the religion, per se, I um, have missed that sense of community with others. Um, and as you know, now living in a very rural area, <laughs> that, you know, that's, that's something that... Um, my wife Deborah and I talk about a lot because she also had a very religious upbringing, being Mennonite. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's a little far to go. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it's it certainly you know having a father who was a minister, um, knowing that I uh, wanted to come out to my family before I left for Europe. <laughs> 
certainly presented some issues. He probably took it the hardest of, of anybody. Um, but I felt like I needed to do that. I knew when I left for Europe that I probably wasn't going to come back for a while. Um, what was his reaction? He cried. Yeah, he cried. He cried. I think he found it incompatible with, with what he would see as a, my pathway to what he held dear. So, but. And has that, his reaction changed? Has he? Yeah, I mean, he still struggles with it. Um, we, we are close, um, but he, he still struggles with it. All these years later, that was 30 years ago. <laughs> so, yeah. Does he um, come to visit and spend time on the farm? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> he did decide to come to my wedding at about five minutes before it happened, so that was good, that was good. Um, so Deborah and I have, have um, only been married for four years at this point. Um, I was, my previous relationship, my ex-partner and I were together for 16 years and we had our two children um, together, um, a daughter and a son. Yes. Yeah. 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 And your previous partner, is she involved with the kids? Yeah. Well? Mm -hmm. Sure. Great. Yeah. So with your father adapting, mm -hmm. um, what about your siblings? Mm -hmm. how, how, how did they handle yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, only one of my siblings... Um, had an issue with it and primarily it was because of his religious beliefs. Um, I think it's probably still an area that we disagree about but we're still love and care for each other so yeah. Well but that worked out as smoothly as mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. it did. Mm -hmm. um, considering your father's background it sounds like he loves you and yep. it's still very much a part of your life. Yeah. Now you mentioned going to college and then I think you said you took time out to go mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. yeah, you know, yeah, pick up yeah, there. How yeah. long did you end up staying? Well, well, if I could back up just a little bit, because I think there are some key things that happened um, prior to that that would be relevant <laughs> to this conversation. Um, yeah, when I was about two years into college, I... Um, already probably had, I think, come to terms for myself. I was maybe two years into realizing that I was a lesbian. Um, I knew growing up that I had um, feelings for other girls that I would now identify, you know, as part of my um, identity, but I think I didn't have the language for it until I was probably about 17. Um, and uh, so a couple years into college, I actually had the opportunity to go to the March on Washington. This would have been in 1987. So this was the major March on Washington. The second, I think the first was in 79. Um, and even though at that point they weren't quite using the terminology of LGBT, um, it was an absolutely powerful experience. Um, Cesar Chavez was there. Um, Jesse Jackson, I think, was running for president. He was there. Uh, Eleanor Smeal. So it was a really, this was a big, <laughs> big deal. Um, went with some other college friends of mine, and that really started a conversation that just hasn't ended for me. Um, so I, I left college and went on a study abroad program in Europe, and it was just a phenomenal time to be there. Um, I traveled all throughout Europe and the Middle East. It was the second intifada. It was, I was in Yugoslavia just as civil war was breaking out. You know, it was the time of the 
wall coming down. It was um, right after the Brixton race riots in London, which is where I ended up living, was in London. And I went to work for um, Only Women Press, which is a lesbian separatist book publishing company, um, still in existence today. And probably some of the most important works that were published for lesbians um, during that time were published there. So the For Lesbians Only anthology um, and a good number of other works that I'd say are pretty important to our history. Um, and worked closely with Lillian Mohan, who was the, the publisher, and um, she's still going strong in, <laughs> in London, um, but, and originally from the U.S., although she has spent all of her adult years um, in England, but a, just a phenomenal person to be mentored by. Um, and I did spend a few years really in what I would call a separatist lesbian community. Um, and those years were really important to me to, in gaining a sense of who I am and um, who I could become. I, I really have this sense that before that time I was a person for a lot of other people, <laughs> particularly because of my religious upbringing, and after that time I had a better sense for, you know, uh, that I could define who I was as a person. So by the time I ended up, um, unfortunately, uh, my mother became ill. She was dying of breast cancer, came back to visit her. And uh, when I went back, um, I was uh, stopped in immigration and um, they read all of my personal journals and realized um, I was working for a lesbian publisher, that I was going back to my female partner. They separated us in separate rooms, interrogated us separately, and sent me home on the next plane. That's in England. Yeah. So, um... Not allowed? You were traveling with your partner? No, she was there. She, she lived there, yeah. So, um... Yeah, it was pretty terrifying because she didn't know where I was, I didn't know where she was. <laughs> Um, and the interrogation was pretty uh, unnerving. Um, fortunately, I've been back many times, many times since then. It was, you know, someone who clearly had a um, an agenda that um, I felt I shouldn't be in the country. So it took me a long time to get up the nerve to go back. Was there but. Just one Yeah, they wanted me, he wasn't going to put me on a plane right then, but I explained, you know, I've, I've lived here for a number of years. I have things in my home that I would like to get. So the arrangement was for me to go the next morning. And this was about 1989? 90, uh, it was almost 91. It was right, right, yeah, the end of 90, so. So there was no recourse? No. Representation. No. No. <laughs> no. I was considered unfit. I'm sure. Yeah. It was. It's hard for me mm -hmm. to go back to that time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, could I ask another yeah, question? Of course. To, for people that are looking at this, um, could you define the lesbian separatist community? What does that mm -hmm. that look like? Mm -hmm. Outside mm -hmm. structure. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we had a, um, well, I don't know if you're f familiar with Brixton in London, but it's extremely diverse, you know, community. And um, we had a, a house um, that from time to time, different women who were traveling would come and stay for a while, or if um, there were an artist that was working in the city, would come and stay for a while, some students. Um, and it was just considered a safe space for lesbians. Um, and many of us, work, our work 
had to do with um, keeping lesbians safe and keeping our history in in mind and um, uh, you know we would we would facilitate a lot of discussions and workshops and particularly around the books that were being published um, we'd have the authors come in and speak um, but it was just a, a sense of it was a safe space and that we could sort of navigate the world around us um, in a way that we weren't inviting any sort of uh, danger for anyone. So. Thank you for explaining that. So you went and you were there for a total of how many years then before you were kept down? It was almost four years, so about three and a half years. And yeah. when you went off, you went by yourself? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the travel was on your own. Yeah, actually, I... Um, I was really struggling financially in college, and I don't remember what the amount was they said we were supposed to take with us, but I had $400 in my pocket, <laughs> and that, that was it. So <laughs> I made it work somehow, but yeah. So your sent back on the next plane mm -hmm. must have been yeah, it was, such an upheaval yeah, yeah. in your life. And so you get back, and... Yeah, my mother passed away soon after. Um, and thinking back, I just can't imagine, you know, she was younger than I am now, you know, when she passed away. And it makes me sad that in her mind at that time, she imagined with my being a lesbian, that meant she'd never have grandchildren. And so she couldn't have possibly have ever imagined having the two grandchildren, you know, that she has. So um, that's something I wish she could have seen that wasn't in her imagining as far as what would be possible to me, let alone that I would get married to a woman someday. Um, so, yeah, so she passed away soon after, and, um, and that is when I started my relationship with my ex-partner. Um, and uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, we were together for 16 years and we were the first couple in Dauphin County to go through second parent adoption. Um, and I remember the judge um, in the orphans court, which is, you know, not only do you have to go through orphans court, but even though they're biological children, we still had to go through um, a adoption home study. So we had to have somebody come into our home, make sure our home was suitable for these children we were going to be adopting, even though they were gave birth. biological children. <laughs> um, we had used an anonymous donor, and, and I carried both children, but it was really important to us that when they were born that Eileen and I had equal legal rights to, to our children. So the way it worked then, and I think it still works this way some places, is when you go through second parent, second parent adoption, you actually are relinquishing your legal rights to your biological child for those few moments until then you're together adopting your children. Um, <laughs> which is what we had to do in order to ensure that both of us had equal rights in the eyes of the law. So, but they still remained with you. Yes, yeah. I mean, this was like in a court hearing that this happened, you know. Yeah. Um, but the going into it, there were four couples. We all went through it at the same time. It just happened. We were all um, families with two moms. Um, some of us, I believe we, no, two couples had um, biological children, two couples had, ad had adopted children. Um, and from the get-go, the 
uh, judge said there was no way that he was going to approve the second parent adoption. He was completely opposed to it. Um, and somehow I got picked to testify first. Uh, so we had to just provide testimony as to why this was in the best interests of these children. Um, so I testified, and then one by one, each of us testified. And by the end of the hearing, the judge had completely switched his position. Now, granted, the home studies were shared. Our, you know, lawyers spoke. Um, but I will never forget, and I wish that I could get the transcripts from the hearing, but apparently they only release the transcripts if it's contested in some way or something. But um, And he said that if the children that typically came before him in the orphan's court experienced half the love in their homes that our children experienced, he would be out of a job. So that was really powerful. I think that's the one time I can think of in my entire life um, that someone who had a completely opposing view to me was persuaded. And I'm a real believer that, you know, when people have differing emo emotionally or heart-wrenching differing opinions about things, no amount of data is ever going to change their mind but a personal relationship or personal experience will. And so that, that is something that I'm so proud of in my life is that we changed his mind that day. And he has gone on to approve many, many second parent adoptions um, afterward. And, and even the, um, you know, now some places they can do a, what's called a pre-birth birth certificate where you know, both parents' names are on the birth certificate, so you don't have to go through the second parent adoption. Um, but, and how old yeah. Um, I believe my daughter was six and my son was two. They might have been slightly younger than were that. They but there? Oh, yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Which I think was important, too. Were they I don't believe that they were able to be. I don't. I don't think so. Yeah. So. So you didn't go back to college. I did at eventually. Actually, when I was pregnant with my son, the graduation pictures are me like two weeks before my son was born. <laughs> so I did. Yeah, I did. Organizational behavior and applied psychology which is interesting considering I work in agriculture. <laughs> but it's something that I've found that no matter where I've worked off farm, um, understanding how organizations work and having an appreciation for um, what employees need. I mean, it's helpful for us on our farm too, but when I've worked off farm, um, so. So I currently serve as Deputy Secretary of Agriculture for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And um, I didn't know until I read it in a blog post that apparently I'm the highest ranking out lesbian <laughs> working for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So I, <laughs> I was preparing for my speech at, um, you know, Pennsylvania Comes Out for Freedom and read a blog post and asked, are you, is this, is this true? Um, yeah, so, um, so that's, you know, also interesting to me that given, and maybe I should back up a little bit as far as my journey to this place. So um, when uh, so my partner and I split up about 10 years ago. And then six years ago, um, my wife and I, um, I would say, 
made the decision to be serious about being with each other. Um, I remember because it was 10, 10, 10. Um, <laughs> and we, a little bit prior to that, had found we had ended up at a meeting together that neither of us was supposed to be at. Um, and it was, I was working for a sustainable agriculture organization at the time. Um, and she, being a farmer, was asked to attend this meeting. Um, my wife is 11th generation to farm within 15 miles of our home. Um, and her, her family is Mennonite. So that's a whole other, you know, arena to... Um, wonderful in my life. Her, you know, her parents live on the same farm as we do. You know, our kids are there. So it's great. Um, but neither of us ever thought we would find another lesbian who wanted to farm. <laughs> you know, it's not, even though today now I actually know a good number of lesbians, gay men, and even trans farmers. Um, at the time, we each felt sort of isolated in that way. I knew that I wanted to be on a farm. She was just trying to make the decision about coming back to her parents' farm. Having She was farming in New Mexico at the time. And, um, and so, you know, it was, it was just great to find, my goodness, maybe we could make this work. So this is where you met at the meeting? Yeah, so we met, we met at the meeting, um, and so that was a, a little bit before we, you know, really started seriously dating. Um, but pretty much as soon as we started seriously dating and realized we both were looking at the same type of life that we wanted, her parents were ready to retire from their farm and um, at the time didn't think they had any um, options as far as Deborah and her siblings, they didn't think wanted to take over the farm. And to some degree for Deborah, that was because she really didn't want to be by herself in a really rural area farming. So pretty quickly we committed to moving to the farm full time and working out a way to transition the farm to the two of us. And her family's been fantastic. She has three siblings too, um, all really, really wonderful people. And um, uh, I'm trying to think. So it was, I mean, when we got together, it wasn't legal to get married, really. Any, it's hard to believe that only six years ago <laughs> that was the case. Um, so we had a ceremony on our farm cleaned out a barn that hadn't been cleaned out in 30 years, but it was absolutely beautiful. Um, I, not a regret about that day. It was so wonderful. Everything about it was great. Um, but then uh, when it was legal to marry in New York, we went to New York to get married. And then soon after, the interpretation of the law was that that, that would um, be valid here in, in Pennsylvania. So... Um, so with being on the farm, and I then started working, um, or became the president of the Pennsylvania Farmers Union, um, I was named to Governor Wolf's Agriculture Transition Committee um, when he was governor-elect to just talk about, okay, in the new administration, what would agriculture look like? I've never had anything even resembling a government job before, so, I was very naive and had no idea that that was kind of maybe like a job interview, <laughs> you know, that whole experience. I just thought I was writing a report, which I did. Um, and out of that experience ended up being asked to serve as, as deputy secretary. So I was appointed in um, 2015. So, and the secretary and the governor really, you know, they had a strong commitment to diversifying the face of agriculture. Maybe didn't realize how diverse they were going to make it by appointing me, but 
now they've both been wonderful, um, very supportive, and uh, and I think in their mind, you know, they really today's agriculture is very diverse. Um, what we do on our farm is, you know, we have a diversified organic um, produce farm, and we also pasture poultry, and we do all direct sales to our customers. So. Half of what we do is a CSA model, and the other half is marketing to D.C., Baltimore, and, and Harrisburg restaurants. Um, and, you know, Pennsylvania is really well positioned, given how diverse we are in our agricultural community, to, to really thrive. So I'm very excited to be, you know, in the position I am to have the role that I do. So you're in Harrisburg. Yes, and we, I mean, we have, we have at the height of the season about 10 employees, so, oh my goodness, yes, we, could, we couldn't, and we couldn't do it. Them right on the farm? Some. Um, we typically have three full-time employees that live on farm, and then we have an awesome group of young Amish women that work for us um, just during the day, and they put us all to shame with the amount of work that can get done in a day. Um, these are actually the younger siblings in some cases of of some women that have worked for us over the years. So yeah, they're really great. We couldn't do it without them. And Deborah's parents' idea of retirement is instead of working 14 hours a day on the farm, they work like 12, but oh, you know. So still living. Yep, yep, yeah. And the kids, of course, work too. We're actually really missing my daughter with her being away at, at college, so. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I say a couple times a week, I am so grateful to be at the table, you know, and, and I'm grateful for the wonderful leadership that we have in this administration. It is a curious thing to navigate staff, state government. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, and my, you know, I'm serving an appointment. So, um, you know, I can always have that in my head that I'm I'm here to serve in the time that I, you know, have this appointment, and then I'll be back on our farm. And so, I'm sure your hands-on experience means a lot. To the <laughs> I think you work I think it does. I think that that makes a difference for people, and that's been true. The all three deputies right now, and, and the secretary, all are coming from agricultural backgrounds, which isn't always the case. So, I think that means a lot to people. Now that you find that yeah. you were advertised as the first openly catch no. <laughs> no. haven't had anybody. No. No. Mm -mm. No. I, 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 you know, I mentioned to, um, or when I spoke at Pennsylvania Comes Out for Freedom yesterday, I said I, it was supposed to be our coming out story, and I said, I don't really have this, you know, dramatic coming out story. I've been out in every aspect of my life for 30 years and I haven't really, you know, yes, I got sent home on that plane, but, you know, I don't have this big story. And, you know, um, someone said to me, like that is your story. That that's a privilege because not everybody has that, and that was really helpful to me. You know, that helps me appreciate the gift that I've had. I've had the wonderful, you know, so much wonderful family and friends, um, so much support, and even my children. You know, they they know a world growing up with two moms. Um, with a lot of support in their life, you know, going to the Unitarian Church when they were younger and um, just being surrounded by people who care for them, that's their reality. And I think a lot of kids are growing up with that reality. It is hard sometimes to remember that not everybody has that. Um, and yet I'm really glad that our kids are growing up you know, where they have the assumption that they will be accepted, so. Did they ever run into any reaction in the school 
No, in fact, I remember so many times in preschool, I would have teachers call me and say, such and such friend's mom is saying their child's coming home and saying, why can't I have two moms? And I mean, how do you respond to that? I don't know. Um, like, what should I say? To them? <laughs> you know, but it's great you, you have people who love you in your life, regardless of who that is. You know, two moms, two dads, a single parent, a mom and a dad. You know, what's important is that you have people who love and respect you and want the best for you. Right. Yeah, I don't right now have a lot of time for anything other than my work. And then when I'm home, I really want to be home and working on our farm. Um, but, you know, now having a daughter in college, uh, we talk a lot about the advocacy work that, you know, she has a responsibility to do and, um, and just when I can even in my official capacity, speaking at events like at the Capitol yesterday, um, and and my decision to be out, you know, I think that that's really important for young people to see that um, there are adults who are able to be out in their life and negotiating the world around them. Um, and honestly, like I mentioned before, I really feel like when people get to know another person, and I meet a lot of people at my job, and it's not like I introduce myself as a lesbian everywhere I go, but I don't hide who I am. Um, you know, I think it just shifts shifts people's thinking a little, little bit here or there. And I think it also helps that, you know, Deborah being you know, her family being a part of our community for so long and in a very conservative community with a lot of um, plain sack farmers around us, but her family's highly respected in our community. You know, they probably, I don't know, think we're a little strange, but you know, it's, I think, particularly in agriculture, if they see you're doing work and it's working and you're making a go of it and it's working out okay for you. Um, everybody has their story, you know. Um, they can see your, the, your value yeah. in that aspect. Yeah. They can relate yeah. to that aspect yeah. of your life. Yeah. That you're a hard worker. Mm -hmm. You're a productive mm -hmm. farmer. Yep. Yeah. You gotta be all right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, the Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture, Pennsylvania Farmers Union. Um, those would be the two main organizations that are agriculture are they all after related. You did service <laughs> I had to stop all of that when I got this appointment. Um, and I do try, you know, there, there also is a, a group of um, lesbian, gay, and trans farmers. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the film out there, but, um, you know, I speak on panels about what that experience is like because a lot of us live in rural communities. Um, but we're just like the rest of the population of the world as far as how many of us <laughs> Are lesbian, gay, or trans? You know, it's um, it's you know, it's no different than any other occupation. We're there. <laughs> um, so this is a film called Out There. Yeah. And was that at major theaters or just a um, Yeah, 
it's a documentary, yeah. Um, it's through the Queer Farmer Project. So. What would you tell younger people who are part of the LGBT community who have an interest in farming? Mm -hmm. We need young people to come into farming. <laughs> Yeah, um, and and today even urban farming is so big. I would say just volunteer on a farm or or see if you can get a little bit of experience working on a farm. We really need um, we need farmers. It, it's really really important. There are such a small number of young people going into farming today. Um, so I'd say the same for them as I, I would anybody is please try it. <laughs> it's a well, great. We're going to continue to eat. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think particularly for um, you know, yesterday at the Capitol, I met a twelve-year-old trans boy who was just, you know, knock your socks off speaker. And it was because he was just so comfortable in his own skin. Um, and had, you know, his, his mother beside him who just adores him and loves him for who he is. It's so wonderful that some kids have that experience today. I would say in the trans community, that's not the case, you know just the laws, you know, with my daughter going to college in North Carolina, one of the first things I asked was, what are you doing, you know, with HB2 to keep students safe when they're off campus? Um, and it's hard to believe that these laws are still being proposed, um, you know, in our country. So I would say really support for the trans community is vital right now. Um, much as we really needed support, you know, even 10 years ago to have equal rights, that's, trans people are really struggling right now with that. And you know, and that's in our own country and then internationally there's still oh, so yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned your trip to Europe and well, before that, your march on Washington. <laughs> um, I just want to make you aware. You can see it in the material that they also collect materials, mm -hmm. photographs, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. concrete evidence of you know the journey. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Would have anything you'd ever want to donate? Sure. No, just thank you for volunteering for this project. You know, it's really important. Um, uh, yeah, thank you for that. You're welcome. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.